Uh, we're going to uh, have a little bit of fun tonight. Uh, I'm going to set up a series of slides for you. And um, we're going to look at where Immunical came from and the history behind our research and development of this product. So if you just bear with me for a second, I'll, I'll get this going. So where we've been, where we are, and where we're going, we have been around for over 40 years. Um, and we have produced volumes and volumes of research articles and uh, publications, and as well uh, uh, collected probably over 80 different worldwide patents on our product, the Munical. But where did this all come from? Well, here's a nice picture of one of my lifetime heroes, Dr. Gustavo Bunos. And he's that kid standing there, uh, staring out into space, um, <laughs> wearing a nice pair of shorts and, and patent leather shoes. I, I guess that was in vogue. Uh, this is uh, just um, before the war in Europe. He's uh, originally from Italy, and uh, these are his parents. Here's him uh, a little bit later on. And at this point in time, um, I believe the war was on. This is still in Italy. And uh, you could see uh, Dr. Bunos um, uh, standing there. Everybody's actually very well dressed. You you got to give the Italians uh, kudos for their style. Um, but he's looking very much like Elvis Presley. Um, look at that haircut. And this is before Presley uh, came out. So he was ahead of his time, uh, clearly. Uh, very good, good looking young man and and uh, still hiding the fact that uh, in that head of his uh, arrested a true genius. Uh, this is a picture of what most people remember Dr. Bunos is looking like. Um, it took about two hours to clean him up for this picture. Generally, his hair is all over the place, looking very Einsteinian. Um, and he has a smile on his face, which, uh, again, is unusual. Um, uh, he's a self-professed uh, cranky old man. Um, so Dr. Bunos is really the initial genius behind this product. And, and let's see how this all started. Now, um, Gustavo was a trained surgeon. Uh, here we see him in uh, the surgical suite um, way back when. Uh, you could tell that he's Italian. Look at his hand there. He's going, where's my scalpel? And uh, <laughs> this uh, was going to be his future. But um, because of uh, the war, uh, he decided that uh, he was going to do what so many other people have done, and that is move to America and uh, find your fame and fortune. Uh, America seemed like the land of uh, milk and honey. And so uh, he picked up and immigrated to the United States. And he landed in Indianapolis at a rather prestigious institution. But when he got there, he found out um, that the Americans had a, a certain chauvinistic view of the practice of medicine and people who did not have their degree from the United States generally could not get a license to practice medicine. So uh, Gus, being an extremely clever person, decided that he was going to go into research. And he did some really, really great work uh, down there in Indianapolis, but one day received a letter from the government and it read, uh, Dr. Bunos, uh, we're sorry, your visa has expired. Um, you now need to leave our country. And this was um, such a uh, distressing situation. Um, here is uh, a congressional record where it was brought up uh, to the House that uh, the United States had asked uh, Dr. Bunos to leave, and they were mourning his loss and uh, how terrible the thing that was, but uh, he had no choice. He had to leave. Um, fortunately for me, 
um, uh, Gustavo uh, moved to Montreal, uh, literally in my backyard. Uh, this is a picture of uh, Montreal General Hospital. So the United States' loss became Canada's gain, and he threw himself uh, right back um, into research. Now, remember, I mentioned that Dr. Bunos was originally a surgeon. So he was going to focus on surgical research, but with a twist. Uh, we, he asked a question, and I'm not sure whether anybody had asked it before, but it sounds like a simple question. Why is it that if you take the same patient, the same age, uh, the same surgical diagnosis, the same surgery, and one of these patients will end up um, leaving the hospital in a week and uh, getting back to work, uh, but the other one would end up in the intensive care unit uh, sometimes for months and sometimes would expire. What was at play that take, given the same situation, some patients ended up doing really well and some did not. Well, you could probably ask a child and they would suggest, well, maybe it's something that these patients were eating. And um, the, uh, Dr. Bunos uh, <laughs> felt this was a very good place to start. This is a great poster from from uh, from the nineteen fifties, uh, 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 looking at nutrition and proteins in particular. And there it reads: proteins, food for growth and repair. So that looked like a good idea in the nineteen fifties and in the nineteen sixties. But something else was at play. Uh, there was the development of a new field of medicine called immunology. Uh, immunology wasn't even a specialty then. It was just a branch of physiology. And uh, because Dr. Bunos was working at McGill University in Montreal, uh, we teamed him up with a very brilliant young PhD candidate called Dr. Patricia Kongshavin. Now, Dr. Kongshavin, you see her here um, um, doing some work in a lab. Uh, Dr. Kongshavin is recognized as the great grandmother of clinical immunology. And why would we give her a title like that? Um, because uh, Patricia wrote the first chapter in the first book of clinical immunology that was broadly uh, distributed amongst um, medical doctors. So she was right in there at the beginning, even before immunology was a specialty. So the two, the two of them got to work and they started uh, looking at different proteins and different amino acids, uh, knowing that it was likely going to be a protein that was going to do something to improve immune function and to save these patients uh, from uh, a poor outcome. And uh, most of the poor outcomes were uh, things like uh, opportunistic infections or infections that came from, from, uh, from the surgical suite. So uh, they were collecting anything they can get their hands on and throwing it into experiments to see if anything would happen uh, to the immune response. And of course, uh, they were doing this in test tubes. They were doing this in, in, uh, in animals. And they came across a few things, but nothing that you would call earth shattering. One day, one day a box shows up on Dr. Bunos's desk. And it's a box from Europe. And uh, Gustavo opens up the box. And inside the box is this fine white powder. Now, this is in the 1970s. And back in the 1970s, if you received the box in the mail with fine white powder, uh, you tended to be a little suspicious about it. But uh, fortunately, um, this box had a note on it. And the note read, Dear Dr. Bunos, we understand that you're looking at uh, a protein biochemistry. 
Uh, this uh, fine white powder is a uh, byproduct of one of our industries uh, here in Europe, and we don't know what to do with it. Uh, we've been dumping it uh, in the fields. We've been dumping it in the river, and the government had asked us to stop doing this because the rivers were overgrowing and the fields were overgrowing. Very interesting. Um, it also carried a check of $10,000, which I'm sure influenced Gus to put it into his experiments. And so he did. And lo and behold, a couple years later, we realized that there are groups of laboratory animals that are living, these animals are living between 30 and 50% longer. Now, this was something that drew a lot of attention. It's not that we were stretching out the lifespans of these mice, um, but what we were doing was imparting upon them an added defense against things that otherwise would have done the men, like certain cancers, like certain infections. And so this was really something um, that uh, made you turn your head. And so the team started to get some more attention and continued on um, their, their work on this, this uh, white powder and uh, with some very, very interesting outcomes. One day, the experiments stopped working. The placebo group and the group taking this fine white powder, um, they were having the same results. And uh, Dr. Bunos uh, went into a depression because of this, because uh, of what looked like so promising and so exciting stopped working. And um, he was uh, uh, sitting at home uh, alone or in his apartment, um, uh, recovering from hip surgery. And um, what do you do if you're sitting at home? Um, you watch TV. And on comes this cooking program. And the chef in the program is complaining that for the last year or two, the cheeses coming from Europe just didn't taste the same. They just were not as tasty, uh, as lively. And it was because um, in Europe, uh, it was before the European Union, but they still had uh, commonplace uh, laws and regulations through the countries. The regulations were that the cheeses needed to be pasteurized at a higher temperature. And a light shone on top of Dr. Bunos's head, uh, looked back at the, the protein that he was using in his experiences. It was a whey protein. And if the, the dairy products in Europe are being pasteurized at a higher temperature, then perhaps it was affecting the protein that he was receiving. And uh, what he did um, uh, after he recovered was immediately go find a dairy company uh, locally that was able to produce this specific type of whey protein um, at a much lower temperature for pasteurization. And then the experiments st started to work again. And so they were continuing, um, uh, but they still did not know why this white protein, whey protein isolate, um, what it did, why these animals were living longer. And it was in one of these uh, little breakout rooms, uh, uh, just a room uh, just outside the, the laboratory facilities, uh, sharing an awful uh, cup of coffee. Um, where uh, Dr. Bunos is explaining to another doctor, uh, Dr. Batiste. And uh, Dr. Batiste said, well, I've been just reading about this um, newer uh, natural protein in humans called glutathione. Um, maybe uh, your product raises glutathione. And they went ahead and it took them a little bit of time. But lo and behold, 
it turned out to be true. This white protein powder, uh, later called Immunical, was raising glutathione levels in these animals. And it was by raising the glutathione levels that these animals had a stronger resistance to major diseases and other things that would kill them early. Now here you see the original team um, from McGill who, who made this discovery. If you'll notice, all of them are smiling, um, except for the guy in the bottom right. They were all taking the product <laughs> because of the results that they saw in the animals. The guy in the bottom right didn't like the taste. So tough for him. <laughs> so uh, uh, now the team knew that this protein was raising glutathione. So what is glutathione? Glutathione is a naturally occurring substance that appears in every single cell of your body. And it is um, absolutely necessary for life itself. Uh, let me just say another thing about glutathione. Um, uh, if you're gonna remember any slide tonight, remember this one. You can't raise your body's glutathione levels by eating actual glutathione. If you eat glutathione, it becomes rapidly broken down uh, in your intestines, and it never makes it from your mouth to your cells. Glutathione is made inside of your cells, and the way to raise glutathione levels in your body is to give your cells the building blocks or what we call precursors. These are specific nutrients that your cells stitch together to make glutathione. So remember this, eating glutathione is not an efficient way to raise your body's glutathione levels. You need to eat the precursors. And that's what that white protein powder represented, the most powerful source of precursors for um, for uh, an organism to raise its glutathione levels. And um, if you haven't heard of glutathione, um, this will become part of your regular language in uh, very few years. Um, there's over 175 uh, medical and scientific publications on it. Let me just put that into context. You all have heard of vitamin C, and you all have heard of vitamin D. If you look at all the medical and scientific publications on vitamin C and vitamin D, they're only about half, about half of what there exists on glutathione. So although the uh, medical field knows about glutathione, well, this is uh, going to just filter through. And uh, you, if you haven't already heard about glutathione, uh, you will very soon. So now we know that this um, pregenitor to Immunical raises glutathione. So the next step is let's look at human diseases that seem to be deficient in glutathione. And doing that, we were able to do our first human study. You see, in the 1980s, uh, when AIDS was raising its ugly head, uh, if you got AIDS, it was essentially the kiss of death. Um, fortunately, these days, we have uh, excellent medications that uh, uh, can keep uh, HIV and AIDS uh, patients alive for indefinitely. But back then, it was really a bad news. So we uh, read uh, some articles, um, uh, for example, coming out of uh, California, where HIV positive or AIDS patients were, by definition, glutathione deficient. And uh, we immediately jumped on that and, and, and uh, uh, submitted uh, proposals to do human studies 
on AIDS. Now, you can't just decide to do a human study. You've got to jump through all kinds of hoops, uh, through regulatory processes, through boards of, of ethics, uh, through the government. You can't just do a human study. It's, it's, it's a lot of work to be able to do that. And at the time, because AIDS carried such a poor prognosis, um, the Board of Ethics uh, looked at our proposal and said, okay, these people are going to die anyways, so go ahead and play with your protein powder. And uh, it's a great thing that they did that because what we showed uh, with our initial studies was just profound. Uh, we um, uh, were able to take uh, patients uh, who, who weighed 80 and 90 pounds and get them back to work. We were able to uh, decrease viral loads, so sometimes to zero. We were able to increase uh, what we call CD4 uh, lymphocyte counts, which is um, the white blood cell that, that went uh, bad in, in AIDS. And um, now we, we, we put ourselves on the map because everybody wanted to join in. We got funding from the, the Canadian uh, government through what's called the uh, HIV Trials Network. Uh, other uh, members uh, at McGill joined in. Uh, people from across the world noticed our studies and started writing on it. Um, uh, the the uh, picture of the, the gentleman in your lower left, left uh, that's Dr. Luc Montagnier, uh, who won the Nobel Prize for the discovery of the AIDS virus uh, in that book, you see, uh, Oxidative Stress and Cancer and AIDS, uh, there was, uh, he published that book and there was a complete chapter, um, not on glutathione, but on Immunical, the product name that we used eventually for that white protein powder. So um, we were now on the map. And subsequent to that, we continued publishing on uh, HIV AIDS. So we did work on hepatitis A, hepatitis B, hepatitis C. Uh, we did work in cardiology. Did, we did work on lung disease. Um, and the papers just kept on coming. Um, just enormous amount of research published by this small company using a natural product <laughs> to raise a natural substance in the human body. And of course, uh, subsequently, uh, we um, uh, filed for, for many international patents and um, our team grew. Uh, this is Dr. Wolf Drog, uh, formerly um, the head of immunology at the Max Planck Institute in Germany. Uh, he got wind of what we were doing. He picked up and left and moved to Montreal uh, to work with our team. Uh, he uh, uh, eventually um, developed Immunical Platinum, which is the second type of Immunical we had. And we'll, we'll talk about that another day. Uh, so we had a, a very, very strong team um, that uh, 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 not only kept on doing the research, but commercialize the product so that everybody can have it. And everybody can have it without a prescription. Uh, eventually, uh, through Health Canada, uh, by submitting our research, uh, we were able to make uh, medical claims about the product. We were able to make a medical claim about the immune system. You take Immunical, it's going to um, support and strengthen your immune system. And this is very, very unusual for, for a natural product to be able to say something like that. In fact, uh, I think that we're still the only natural protein that can make that claim. Uh, we went from studying um, people with health challenges uh, to looking at very healthy people. Uh, here's a study way back in 1999 uh, where we uh, took um, groups of university athletes, uh, split them either into a placebo group or an immunical group, um, put them through identical training for an entire summer, brought them back at the end of the summer and demonstrated uh, between a 10 and 15% increase 
in muscle strength and endurance. Uh, this is this was absolutely wild, uh, considering when you look at the Olympics, the difference between the person coming in first place, the gold medal, and the person coming in sixth place is often less than 1%. And we were showing 10 to 15% improvement. Uh, and we, we we went on and, and did that in the geriatrics population too. And a 10% increase in a, in a geriatric patient is, is profound. It's the difference between being in bed or uh, being uh, in a wheelchair, between being in a wheelchair and using a walker, between using a walker and using a cane, um, these are huge, huge differences. So the 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 research kept on expanding, the company kept on expanding, and um, um, with our our added uh, findings in muscular performance, we got another claim that we could make it by taking Immunical, uh, you can increase your muscle strength, uh, uh, do better on the field. And so uh, it spread like wildfire amongst the um, sporting uh, world. Uh, this was our first major uh, Olympics in 2012. Uh, well, this is the uh, Canadian uh, rowing team. Uh, they're showing off their medals proudly, but what was most interesting was this was the oldest <laughs> rowing team uh, at the Olympics, uh, having won their medals and and taking the Immunical. And, and nowadays, uh, Doug and I, uh, during the next Olympics, we, we can be watching it on the TV and point and uh, look at any number of teams, Canadian Olympic team, American Olympic team, uh, Polish Olympic team, uh, British Olympic team, and on and on and and, and point and say, uh, he's on a Munichal, she's on a Munichal. Um, and so, uh, yeah, we're, we're well established um, in, in, in the world of sports, but even more importantly, in the world of conventional medicine. Uh, this is a um, a book um, that I published a number of years ago, and what it is is just um, a collection of articles uh, published in the scientific and medical literature on Immunical, and there are over eighty five studies. Uh, I, I challenge anybody to show me a natural product that has that many studies accredited to their research. And we don't pay for these studies anymore. Now, um, I sit comfortably in an office and I get research proposals from around the world from scientists that they just want to continue this research and show all the things and all the benefits that glutathione has on the human organism. And um, uh, we're going to be covering a lot more of this in future programs. Uh, I know that um, once you start looking at what we're doing, um, you're going to have a whole bunch of questions, some of which we'll answer tonight. Uh, but just to let you know, most of the questions about glutathione, you'll find the answers um, in this book. Uh, this is my fifth edition. And you see some links there uh, where you might be able to um, find this book. But also, um, I'm always updating uh, research articles, I'm always talking about new things in the world of glutathione. So if you're into it, um, uh, please avail yourself uh, to these websites. And um, thank you for your attention. <laughs>